started. Welcome to What to Save, Basic Archiving and Records Management. I want to briefly mention that this workshop is part of a larger series of events tied to the History and Community Conference. We're grateful to our funders, including the Santa Clara County Historic Grant Program, for allowing us to meet today. For those of you who have been attending multiple events and workshops as part of the conference, this is probably your last stop on the whirlwind tour of presentations and programs during this last week. So thank you for joining us. And if this is your first and only time joining us for the History and Community Conference and related workshops, welcome and we really hope you enjoy the workshop. Recordings of this and other events from the week will be online soon, so look out for those. So uh, with that said, I think uh, there's a good number of people here, so why don't we get started? Hello, everyone. I'm Josh Schneider, I'm Stanford University, Christ, and on behalf of the Stanford Libraries and Stanford Historical Society, welcome to the What to Save workshop. Annie Schweiker, digital archivist at Stanford Libraries, has shared a video presentation with us that identifies specific principles and best practices to keep in mind when working with digital files. And I'm also fortunate to be joined today by Natalie Marine Street, manager of the oral history program at Stanford, who will be monitoring questions and generally helping with the workshop. Thank you to everyone who answered the survey sent out before the workshop, letting us know a bit more about who you are. Everyone today should be able to interact via the Q&A, I believe. Uh, and I think you should also be able to send chats to the hosts and panelists. Um, let's try a couple of short polls to learn more about all of you before we jump in. So you should see a poll on your screen asking what kind of organization are you most closely affiliated with? Let's leave that up for a moment. So it looks like a race between educational and nonprofit, and maybe many people work for educational nonprofits, and that's why. Um, but it does seem like we have a good mix of people today working in education, the nonprofit field, as well as uh, government and commercial sectors, as well as a fair number of other. And I, I'm, uh, I know a bit about those from the surveys, but I'm really glad, uh, thankful to everybody for joining us. Uh, we have one more poll question for you we can throw up. And we have people zooming in from, it looks like uh, mainly from the peninsula, um, though we do have a number of people from the South Bay and a handful that don't even live in California. So that's that's very exciting. Thank you everybody very much for joining us today. So the focus of our workshop is on introducing you to archives and records management and letting you know about helpful policies, practices and documentation. And finally, sharing some resources for further viewing. Uh, I wanna note that there's not one way really to consider archiving and records management. I, I noted from the survey results and our poll results that people are coming at this, this question um, from a variety of, of perspectives. We'll be sharing some best practices and information to let you know more about archiving and records management, but we're always learning more about this work. Uh, really, this is just likely the beginning um, for, for many of you about learning about archiving and records management. Uh, and bringing that back to your work. Uh, there's really a lot to learn, but one of the best ways to get started is to uh, attend workshops like this, to get a bit of training, and to think about how to incorporate some of these ideas into your own work. And that's true whether you're interested in creating or developing an archiving or records management program for your nonprofit or company, saving personal or family records, or simply want to know more about how your work as a researcher intersects with the work of those who help you uh, get access to materials of enduring or historical value. So looking at what we plan to cover today in a bit more detail, we're going to start with an introduction to archives and records management. Then we're going to uh, jump into uh, understanding common workflows and practices including how uh, people select and prepare content for archiving, understanding rights and restrictions, some ethical considerations, how to store materials, 
how to ensure materials are discoverable and the content is accessible, and then how to ensure the content remains discoverable and accessible. In other words, what should you know about digital preservation? Uh, we'll look at a couple of case studies and web archiving and email archiving. And finally, we'll wrap up by looking at some trends, uh, undertaking some fun group exercises, and uh, learning some more uh, about uh, some of the additional resources that are available to you freely online. And then we'll wrap up with some, some additional questions. So with that, uh, let's jump in uh, to our introduction of archives and records management. So what is an archives? I, I like to start with this slide because I, I think uh, archives has, uh, that term comes up often and I used to see it when people were, um, you know, pulling together uh, digital files into a zip file and you know that was called an archive and uh, I remember at the time a lot of uh, traditional archivists were sort of what but that's what we do that that's not right they shouldn't take our word um, but I, I'm really excited um, that archiving is really um, ubiquitous in the world today and and rather than argue you know what archives isn't I think it's helpful to think about all the different ways in which people use the term archives and archiving. So according to the Society of American Archives, uh, Society of American Archivists, excuse me, uh, an archives could be an organization that collects the records of individuals, families, or other organizations. In other words, a collecting repository. Uh, an archives can be a division within an organization responsible for acquiring and maintaining the organization's records of continuing value. For instance, uh, an institutional archives. And archives also describes the professional discipline, practice, and study of administering such collections and organizations. So uh, why do societies, organizations, and individuals create and keep records? Um, if folks want to uh, add some of their thoughts um, about why, um, people actually archive records and keep them. Um, you should hopefully be able to add those to uh, the Q&A. Let's see if that works. So uh, some of the reasons that, that I think of about why archives exist and are out in the world, right? Of course, uh, they're maintained by organizations to support research and ongoing operations, um, but they could also be tools for accountability and, and organizational memory, uh, they can help preserve evidence of uh, human rights violations and even serve as a bulwark against the deniability of crimes. So in addition to our personal archives and family archives, when we think about why these archives exist in society, um, they're for pretty critical reasons. Uh, and I see a comment, a sense of their value, wanting to keep the stories alive. I think that's also a, a, a great reason. There are many different types of archives, uh, which you might uh, uh, think, uh, since the list of all the reasons for creating and maintaining an archive is pretty long. Um, and, and I think this also reflects some of the people who are attending today, right? So there are government archives, there are archives at educational institutions like the Stanford University archives, there are corporate archives, religious archives, and community archives, just to name a few. So when I start to talk to people about archives and some of the principles that uh, govern archives, I always want to be very careful because the field of archives is constantly changing. And some of these sort of guiding principles that I think it's helpful to know about, um, you know, I don't know that we're always beholden to these principles. And there might be some ways in which these principles um, really don't apply or, or might actively be harmful to preserving certain stories and certain records, especially of marginalized people who haven't been in a position uh, to determine the guidelines under which their records are maintained and kept. Um, but I do think it's helpful when we're starting to think about how records are maintained to consider the history of how records have been uh, maintained in a lot of the different cases that we run into on a regular basis, like government archives and business archives. Um, one of those principles is that of provenance. Uh, and that basically means maintaining the original context of content helps to ensure the credibility and authenticity of that content, right? Um, there are some related principles as well. Content that comes from one source should be kept, kept separately from content that comes from another source, and the origin of the content should be well documented. Right now, these aren't principles that are always the case, uh, 
But they are considerations that, that archivists keep in mind uh, when we start to work with materials and we, we think to ourselves, what's the best way to ensure that the people who access these materials in the future are accessing these materials and have the best information available to them to know as much as possible about the context in which they were created. That's also why um, records uh, typically we, we think should be kept by archives in the order and manage uh, and manner in which they were originally maintained, uh, what is called the original order. Now, when it comes to digital files and some other kinds of files, there isn't always a, an original order that seems very clear or meaningful. Um, but the idea is that whoever created or collected or managed these archives originally, they might have put a lot of thought into why they organized papers into individual folders or had folders near each other or named them in a certain way. And you, we want to maintain the integrity of, of whatever system they had as much as possible. Um, it could be that some of it is projecting meaning, um, but still, just in case there's some meaning there that was created or maintained by the individual or individuals that created and managed the records, we try not to mix things up um, best as we can. Um, and just generally, we try to preserve the context uh, and the content so that we don't lose information that, that's really critical and integral to understanding the materials or ensuring their authenticity and credibility. So what do we mean by archiving? As I mentioned, there's a few different definitions and people don't always mean the same thing. Um, but typically when I think about archiving, I think about the various functions that are associated with, with the work of archiving. And those include appraising materials, um, acquiring and bringing in materials in, in according to whatever methods and workflows um, have been uh, decided by uh, you or your organization. Um, Archival processing is typically considered arranging and describing the materials. So that means trying to prepare them to make sure that you're protecting uh, all of that uh, original context and that um, you uh, can make them as discoverable and accessible as possible to researchers. Um, preservation and storage. So this is obviously critical. Um, we'll, we'll talk in a little bit about some of the uh, preservation and storage conditions of physical materials. And we'll also hear from Annie a little bit later about some of the special considerations that come from working with digital materials. Uh, and then all the stuff that you do with, with the materials you collect, um, you know, now that they're preserved and stored, right? And from my perspective, we really want uh, the materials that are collected typically to be used. Now, there may be uh, special considerations for why we don't want to make them available right away. Maybe there are privacy considerations or other ethical considerations. Um, but typically, the reason why we're preserving these materials is so that at some future point, uh, they can be made accessible for all the reasons we described around why people maintain archives. Um, and how that access takes place, um, it might be um, answering questions about the material based off of uh, information that's contained in them that would be referenced, um, providing physical or digital access to the materials in some way, or providing public outreach programming, right? So maybe you'll talk about the materials or you'll, uh, other people can access the materials and write books about them or create documentaries um, or community programs and events. All of these things uh, I would consider part of sort of the world of archiving. So where does records management fit into all of this, right? So if, if you're um, attending this workshop because you manage your family's records and you want to try to do that uh, as, as well as possible so that you don't lose some of those materials, you might feel like uh, maybe records management doesn't apply to you. But I think the principles of records management are really helpful to think about when, when you uh, consider all the different ways in which the materials are created and uh, you think about uh, that very important context of the materials. So uh, records management um, could include archiving as, as one step of a fuller life cycle of records management. Uh, identifying, preserving, and ensuring access to the materials um, is often a step in a larger rubric at an institutional level within organizations. And it's often aimed to minimize institutional risk. And when we think about how to advocate for uh, maybe our own collections or um, managing the history effectively at our own institutions, right, or at our own uh, historical societies, it's often helpful to, to think about, well, from the perspective of the institution, 
one of the biggest roles of the archives is, is helping to uh, mitigate institutional risks and, and maintain enduring uh, records of historical value that could help in all sorts of ways in the future. Um, so we'll think a little bit more later about how to sort of use the position of archives to help advocate for them effectively. What's a record? Uh, a record thought of uh, very expansively could be considered information in any form, right? It could be a website, it could be an email, it could be a piece of paper that was created, received, or maintained by an organization or agents pursuant to legal obligations, right? So fulfilling the business functions of the organization or in pursuit of the organization's mission. So I mentioned that, uh, and you may have heard before, a record cycle or a records continuum. It's often uh, used to describe how records are created, used, archived, um, and then potentially reused in the future, right? So uh, I think an old school way of thinking about records management was the, you had materials, they were actively used, they were active, and then they were no longer used anymore and you sent them to the basement, right? Or to offsite storage. And then maybe every once in a while, somebody would, would want to reference them and they'd need to track down the box. And that's probably still is some piece of the records management cycle. Um, but I think now that people are engaging so much more effectively uh, with their own history, not just the narratives of history, but the data of history, we see the potential for reuse of archival materials, used not just by researchers, but by the organizations themselves when reflecting on their history, when celebrating anniversaries, and all the other ways in which materials might be reused uh, to support the missions of the organization or larger societal missions. So uh, what you see on your screen are two different examples that I've found um, that describe what this work cycle, uh, this life cycle for records might look like. As I mentioned before, if you're considering how to advocate for or grow in archives within your organization, it may be helpful to position your archiving initiative or program as one part of a larger records life cycle aimed at minimizing organizational risk, right? So that risk might include staff turnover, community losses, technology changes. All of those are risk factors that can limit an organization's ability to both collect and maintain materials of enduring historical value and successfully achieve its organizational goals. So what about family or personal archiving? So I would say if you're attending this workshop and really uh, you're here to know how to manage your own materials, maybe your artistic materials, your writing uh, over time and how to do that effectively or your family's papers, right? The same principles I've been mentioning uh, really apply throughout, right? So you'll wanna follow the best practices for uh, managing and storing and tracking your physical materials and digital files. I think any of us who have worked with uh, family and who or who have inherited family materials um, know that when you find a photograph that's unidentified or without description, right, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking, especially when it seems like uh, no one is around to uh, identify some of the people in the photograph or the event of the photograph. So uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the importance of description, uh, what we call metadata. Um, but I, I think you'll find that the same principles will apply um, uh, pretty well um, for your own personal records and family records as well. And then uh, some of the collaborations and partnerships that I'm going to be talking about, I think those also apply. And we could talk more about that during the Q&A. Um, but I, I think there's lots of uh, movement towards um, communities online, different standards for managing and describing materials that it can also be really helpful for you. Um, so we're going to be talking about understanding some common workflows and practices. And these are, I, I don't know if you remember from a few minutes ago, I talked about sort of all the different functions of archiving, right, where you, uh, you go out maybe in appraised materials, you might uh, bring the materials in, describe them so they can be accessed store and preserve them, and then make them accessible. So each of those different functions, there's been some best practices that have been designed and iterated on um, probably in the last 10 to 20 years, especially, um, that I thought might be helpful to talk about. And I think, again, apply pretty broadly. How do you select and prepare content for archiving, right? How do you decide what's important to keep? Uh, and to really prioritize, right? To spend your time on and maybe um, some family time on or your organization's time on, right? This is what institutions call appraisal and accessioning. Um, some of the questions that we ask um, are, 
do the materials fall into our collecting scope, right? Do they support our, our own mission and goals? Um, when you're in archives or a library, that, that's very straightforward. But if it's, uh, or can be, I guess, more straightforward. Um, but if your mission is something that doesn't necessarily even have to do with public history, but someone says, I'm an old officer at a nonprofit and I've got these uh, old reports or old photos, right? Sometimes it's not as clear uh, what's valuable, what's a good use of time. Um, another question we ask is, are we the best and most appropriate home for this content, right? So I occasionally, someone will mention something and they'll say, doesn't this sound fantastic? you know, uh, would you be interested in acquiring it? And I'll say, yes, it sounds fantastic, but honestly, um, I don't think that we are the best place to acquire it. So some of how we spend our time is referring people to other organizations that for whatever reason uh, would be a better fit for the materials. Uh, we do collect pretty broadly at Stanford in a variety of different ways and then the university archives, um, but we're not the archives for um, the whole world and we shouldn't be, right? There's, there's lots of different organizations that collect manage and preserve materials. Um, and that's one of the ways I, I, in which I, I was talking about that collaboration is really key, right? So you're hearing from me some, some of uh, you know, what, what I think about um, and, and sort of my own experiences, but hopefully this is just one of many conversations that you have in the future. And I know many archivists uh, and, and others who, who would be interested in learning more about uh, sort of uh, your situation, your collections, your materials. And I, I uh, wanna be sure that I convey that um, because those are some of the people who I, I think uh, could be really great consultants, whatever your question might be. Another question is, do we have the ability to effectively store the materials, right? And that's sort of along the same lines. If somebody brings me very specialized um, files that can only be played using a certain device and we don't have that device, then I'm not sure that we are, again, the, the best um, you know, group to store the materials. Um, but there's also financial costs associated, right? Um, and I think this is true no matter what the organization. So we ask what one time and ongoing costs would there be um, associated with processing, preserving, and making those materials available. Um, we also ask questions about the history and condition of the materials. So um, that would be things like, where did the stuff come from, right? Um, do the, the people who created the stuff, um, would they be comfortable with the stuff coming to Stanford? I, I think that's especially true for us when uh, we're offered materials that um, aren't directly from the donor or the person who created the materials, but some third party. Um, so there's a variety of, of um, considerations that go into uh, acquiring materials and deciding whether it might be um, the right fit for your organization. Um, and of course, there's lots of alternatives to collecting the original materials. So sometimes people offer stuff um, to us and, and we might say, well, those things sound amazing. Um, you know, let us direct you to a community organization, which is a fantastic fit for that. And we're glad to digitize the materials um, because we have that resourcing and we can share the digital files with you and we could share them with you know, the community organization. Um, but I think especially as we move towards digital files and uh, you, you might want to um, store the materials or the files in multiple locations. And we wanna be able to support that, right? We wanna support, if you wanna share uh, materials you created as broadly as possible, we wouldn't want to limit that access. So I think that's one of the great things about um, the ubiquity of digital files at this point is how much easier, uh, it, there are many digital preservation challenges and we'll hear from Annie about those in a bit, um, but creating multiple copies and sharing those broadly, I think is, is really a great benefit of people creating many, uh, much of their work in the digital format now. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're also interested in uh, consulting and supporting community members and potentially uh, managing and maintaining their own records, their own files. Um, so this is getting a little bit into the sort of the nitty gritty of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but there's some principles that I, I think would be helpful for anybody who, who's working with uh, materials that are really important to them, right? So. Um, we use uh, documents, uh, instruments uh, in, in uh, the archives that I think are very common for uh, institutional archives um, to track when people give us stuff, 
um, that they had the rights to do that, what they want, uh, if there's any special stipulations with the stuff they're giving us, for us to understand the ways in which we can provide access to materials, right? Um, and these are designed to sort of ensure that we're following the wishes and the guidelines of the people who are sharing materials with us. Um, but I think um, this is also a meaningful sort of step um, even when it comes to something like family history, right? So I'm not expecting that if you're getting photographs um, from a family member, you're gonna have them sign a very official uh, document necessarily that stipulates um, what they're going to do with the materials, but it is a very, uh, maybe you will, I, I, I might even suggest it, I, I don't know. Um, but I do think it's really helpful to think about um, checking with family members who have shared materials in one context and making sure you have permission to save them and to provide access to them in whatever context you have in mind, right? Uh, and I think that's just generally true. We'll, we'll talk in a minute um, about uh, how to be thoughtful when working around collections. And that, that really comes down to, in some ways, being uh, thoughtful around working with other people and respecting people um, and, and thinking about their wishes when it comes to uh, materials that they created. Here's an example of that. From, from the collecting side, I, I think it's really important to be upfront with the people who are sharing content with you. If, if you're um, someone in the position of collecting materials um, by explaining why you're collecting the content um, and, and what's gonna happen to those materials, right? You might clarify the conditions under which you're gonna make that stuff available. It, I think it's very sad for people um, when they learn uh, often how busy archives can be and that there's a backlog of collections yet to be uh, fully processed. On the other hand, some people are just grateful to have materials be preserved and accessible and discoverable so that if somebody uh, is interested in accessing the materials, they know where to go, they know the materials are still gonna be available. Um, and there's other ways in which they can, uh, you know, access and, and interact with the materials. Uh, please be mindful of the information um, that goes along with the materials and do your best to, to store those. I, I think, uh, again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about description and metadata, um, but this stuff, this contextual information is absolutely essential um, or can be essential um, for historians and other researchers or your family or the organization. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to overstate it because if someone is sharing materials with you, or if you're sharing materials, that's amazing. Um, but it, it, it goes so far if somebody has any information about the context of the materials, whether they share that with you in writing or through something like an oral history, um, to, to try to capture that and store that. Um, and we'll talk about one a little bit. But I think just generally it gets at that sort of context of the materials, which is so critical to understanding um, how they were used and why they were generated and, and why some people found them important enough to keep. Um, and I find I, I really um, want to be especially thoughtful around potentially sensitive materials. Um, and for some collections, that might mean, um, you know, I talked about identifying people in photographs, but maybe there are cases where the people in the photographs don't want to be identifiable, right? Maybe being identifiable could, um, you know, potentially subject them to some liability or criminal liability. Maybe um, for me working on a college campus, there, there's cases where students get up to certain things and, you know, they wouldn't want their photos to be available online in 20 or 30 years associated with their names. Um, so we really want to be thoughtful around um, any materials that are shared with a reasonable expectation of privacy. Now, if you're the one sharing materials, um, you know, it, it's, it's the other side of this, right? So you have some power with your materials uh, and you should have some say in how those materials are, are described and made discoverable and accessed. So this gets at, I think, a lot of the ethical considerations that I was, I was hoping we'd have uh, a little bit of time to cover, um, particularly when, when working with at-risk populations or documenting personal and community trauma, what challenges might you expect to run into, right? And how do you mitigate those challenges? So again, I think it's really important when you're um, engaging in an archival uh, effort or activities that you're really upfront about collecting materials and, and the goals of your project. Um, what will happen to the information you gather, who will have access to it, any privacy concerns. I, I often find the people sharing materials with us um, haven't 
thought about the privacy concerns in the same way I have. So having a conversation around those um, can be helpful. And finally, as a, I, what, uh, a um, quote I've often heard is that, you know, librarians know what to keep and archivists know what to throw away, right? Maybe not everything needs to be preserved. And I, I think that's okay, right? Because we need to make choices anyway. We need to prioritize things. The uh, Professional Association for Archivists, uh, one of the best known is the Society of American Archivists. And I'm just sharing here a, a few um, uh, quotes that I've pulled from their core values and, and code of ethics. Um, they tie ethics to uh, you know, a critical piece of what it means to be an archivist and, and to work in an archives, right? Archivists document and protect uh, materials. They protect records integrity from tampering or corruption. They also promote open and equitable access to records in their care. Uh, archivists should uh, be very careful in their roles, right? It's a very powerful role deciding what to keep, um, what's thrown away, what's described, um, what's prioritized. Um, and we're encouraged to consult with everybody uh, and especially the people who are uh, sharing materials with us um, to help make sure um, that all of our decisions are, are informed. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I might um, move through this slide a little bit quickly. Um, but as I mentioned, um, you know, this especially comes up with me when it comes to documenting marginalized communities and especially um, activists on the Stanford campus. Um, I, I really want to be careful. Um, you know, I want to document that history. It, it's really important. Um, but I want to make sure I do it in a way that the groups that we're, we're trying to document um, are in support of. So that often means instead of just sort of going out, taking photos, um, gathering recordings from YouTube and, and other um, public places, that I get in touch with, with a, a group or an organization or a person and say, hey, this is where I'm coming from. This is our interest in trying to document this history. You know, what do you think should be included among that documentation? Um, and oftentimes that leads to additional kinds of conversations that, that I find very helpful. Okay, so now we get into this stuff. If you've been sort of, um, you know, dozing off, I think this is uh, one of the areas that I think um, people would be really excited to hear about, which is how do you store the stuff that you care about, right? So um, Natalie can share with you um, a, a link uh, provided by the Society of American uh, Archivists on how to store materials effectively. I'm pulling some helpful information here. Um, so uh, you wanna keep materials fairly cool and in a fairly low relative humidity to limit deterioration. Try to avoid um, big temperature and humidity changes, right? So it's in some ways it's better to keep something a little bit warm or a little bit too or less humid rather than have it um, go up and down and up and down. But we, often when we see deterioration of materials, it's because they were subjected to very extreme uh, temperature or humidity changes over time. Um, so you may want to avoid putting materials in front of windows or vents or humidifiers. Um, try to avoid direct sunlight, right, for the same reason. Um, you've probably seen opened up an old folder and part of the paper was discolored because it was exposed to the light. Right, um, especially older kinds of uh, paper, but or even newer paper, it gets discolored pretty fast. If or if you've left a newspaper out for for a week, you'll already see the deterioration. Um, so it's good to keep that stuff um, out of direct sunlight, um, and then try to reduce risk of damage from water, insects, and rodents. So that means um, keep stuff off the floor of the basement or up in the attic, where, you know, places where you're maybe less likely to check very often. Um, and away from pipes um, and away from places where, where food, right? So I, I liked having all these nice things out in, in near my kitchen because I thought it was really nice and lovely to have all my books there. And then I saw that like my books weren't looking so great. Um, and it's the same with archival materials, right? Basically the steam from the kitchen uh, over time had, had sort of um, affected the humidity of, of the materials I cared about in my kitchen. So, right, I, I learned that lesson the hard way. Um, follow, follow my, uh, don't follow my example, um, follow these guidelines and hopefully your materials will stay safe. Um, 
when it comes to actually housing the materials, uh, we often use boxes that uh, you can find from some of the companies that are available online. Some of these are, you know, they could be fairly expensive because they're, they were produced in a certain way to uh, limit the acid content. Um, but in general, um, you know, standard boxes can be fine, standard bankers boxes, as long as you're not trapping a lot of acidic materials within those boxes. Um, but we do have, if you're interested, you don't have that much stuff and you're interested in ordering some materials, uh, we do have an equipment list through that link. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that often when you put materials in a box and it slumps over a little bit, right? If it's slumped for a few days, that's fine. But if you don't open that box again for another 10 or 20 years, then that slump is probably going to be sort of inherited in the physicality of the item. And, and that's probably not ideal either. So you want to make sure that everything is supported the same way you would handle materials, right? And hold them to make sure you don't drop them and that they're supported. You want the boxes that we use in different housing um, to, to support the materials in just that same way. Okay, so how do you ensure that all the stuff that you collect is discoverable? You've heard me throw around this for metadata for a while. Um, basically, uh, metadata is just data about data, information about the content you have. Um, you probably think about it with your digital files when you see the detail view, right? And you see the, the creation date and the creator, right? And the file path. Um, but it's also true for any physical materials you have that you want them to be well described. Um, standardized and consistent description supports the discovery of the materials. Um, so you please aim to uh, generate or maintain some basic information about the material. If you, if you have more information, great. Um, write that down somewhere. We prefer spreadsheets, but even writing it you know, on the outside of a folder will be helpful to people in the future. Um, some of the basic fields that uh, we have found very helpful that researchers ask about, who created the item, uh, does it have a title? You know, where was this photo taken? Uh, when was this document collected? And then any, any other description you might have, right? Um, so uh, was this document collected at a particular event, right? Or is it associated with some other item that, that, that you might have or that's available elsewhere? Um, for personal materials, you might consider consulting, as I mentioned, with a local historical society or a university. A lot of people don't realize that those institutions are, would be interested in their materials. Even if you're not interested in giving away the materials, um, they might be helpful in uh, helping you think through some of the challenges you might be facing around storing or describing the materials or digitizing materials. Um, there are many communities to share digital files online, um, but remember that just um, adding materials to uh, you know, uh, Instagram or um, Facebook or even Google Drive or Dropbox doesn't ensure that they'll preserve, be preserved in the future. Um, if you have lots of stuff, you might consider a lightweight uh, collection or content management system, uh, such as WordPress or Emeka. Um, but again, uh, that doesn't necessarily handle the preservation challenges. It might help though with the ex uh, access um, uh, perspective. So how do we make stuff available at Stanford? Um, you may know um, that uh, we provide access to some of our stuff via catalog records, just like you were gonna find a book or a map or anything else. Um, but sometimes these archival collections can be huge, hundreds of boxes, right? Thousands of, of terabytes of files. So for that reason, we often create something called um, a, a finding aid, right? So, um, finding aids are more in-depth research guides um, to an archival collection. Usually they provide both helpful contextual info as well as more or less a detailed um, collection listing. So you can see on the left side here, we have some description about materials, um, uh, this collection that we have in the archives. And on the right side, right, if you scroll further down, um, you can see actually a listing of what's in each box and some, in some cases what's in each folder, right? All of this is accessible via Google, right? Which we like because that means people can find the stuff. So even if this is OAC, it's the Online Archive of California, uh, it's a great hosting site for these research guides or finding aids. But even if people don't know to go there, if they search Google for a particular name or organization, they'll often come across our stuff, which would have instructions of how to access the materials in person Person or a notification of whether something has been digitized. Um, the kind of descriptive information I mentioned, you can see on the left, it often includes sort of a, a general sense of what's 
um, in the collection. We often call that a scope and content statement. And then there might be a, a biographical organizational history, right? Which is helpful to have somebody write. Um, but oftentimes when you collect materials from a person organization, they've included a, a biography or, or a history and you could pull directly from that. So um, how does one access an archive? Um, I don't know that everybody on the call is, is going to be particularly interested in this topic, but I'll just briefly say that the materials that organizations take in, they try to make them as accessible as possible. One of the ways they do that for physical materials uh, and some digital materials is to provide access in a controlled setting. Um, such as a reading room. So you could see some people accessing some materials in a reading room here. Um, they all also try to digitize materials or provide access online. So at this point, we're going to take a brief break. Um, I'll be here if you have some uh, questions. And uh, when we get back, we're going to hear from Annie about digital preservation. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I noted a couple of questions. Um, I, I uh, briefly answered one, but I see two more that I'll, I'll answer before we get started. Um, I see, do you have any recommendations for free or low cost website builders? What do you think of using a YouTube channel for gathering video recordings? Um, so on the, on the first question, uh, I've seen people use free versions of Omeka or, or um, WordPress um, for lower cost website building. Um, again, that, that doesn't necessarily solve the digital preservation challenges, as, as we'll hear from Annie in a, in a moment, um, but it could help gather the materials and build a community for them um, and, and establish uh, a little asset database in which the materials are described, which could be very helpful. Um, what do you think of using the YouTube channel? So this is also really interesting. Um, down, th there are ways in which I've been able to sort of download some materials from YouTube, but the best way that I have found to download materials from YouTube is to get in touch with the web manager uh, or the, the, the manager of that YouTube channel, who then gives me back end access. So I, I would say if the uh, purpose is to um, have a community where people are loading uh, the video recordings or, or if it's your own video recordings and this is how you're keeping them. I, I think that's really great. Um, we just want to remember that YouTube could go away for any reason um, and their terms and conditions don't provide you with any recourse um, if they just took all those videos offline, right? It, it's, it's really, um, I don't think that's something they would do without providing some notice, but it's a business and many businesses, uh, you know, come and go. So um, you, I, I wouldn't say using that as your sole preservation and access mechanism um, you know, is, is, um, you know, a full long-term solution. Um, but as one way of keeping a copy and providing access, I, I think that sounds great. I, you know, everybody knows about YouTube and it would be easy for them to people to find and access the videos. So I, I hope that was helpful. I'm glad to also follow up with you afterwards. Um, what's the best way to store newspaper clippings? Uh, that's a really good question. So, um, First, I, I just want to note many newspapers um, have been digitized and the, those uh, clippings are available online. So um, if your um, goal is to, um, not, not all, and especially local newspapers, that's not the case. And even the ones that have been digitized, sometimes um, those are behind a paywall. So it, it might not be something everybody can access, um, but it, it sort of gets at maybe why you're saving the newspaper clipping. So if it's sort of the, the artifactual value that this was the newspaper that so-and-so gave you or that describes a person and you collected on a certain day, um, then uh, I, I find uh, polyethylene um, is, is a effective sort of plastic, plastic holder. Um, the issue that we have with that um, is, you know, that paper is very, very acidic. And if you're maintaining a whole newspaper, it's, you know, uh, that it makes it tougher, I think, over time. It, it, it's going to continue to degrade. There isn't so much we can do about that. Um, but, you know, if, if you have it in an optimal temperature and humidity conditions, that, that would definitely slow the degradation um, process. Um, you might also digitize those clippings, um, but again, that's not preservation. And I wouldn't advocate throwing out the clippings in that case, but that, that might help you just know that you do have an additional copy somewhere. And of course you could share it more broadly. So I, I hope that was helpful. And again, Carol, I'm very glad to, to follow up with you on that. 
So um, welcome back from the break. Um, we are going to now watch a video. I'm Annie Schweikert and I'm a digital archivist here at Stanford Libraries in the Department of Special Collections. In my role here, I work with digital collections materials. So in this presentation, I'll be giving you an overview of challenges you might encounter specific to digital collections. So let's get started. First, I'm going to talk about the two types of digital content, just so that we can visualize the sort of content we're trying to preserve and access here. Um, born digital materials just means anything that was originally created in a digital format. So that could be documents on a laptop, photos on a digital camera, an interactive software program on a CD-ROM, files in cloud storage like Google Drive or iCloud, or social media accounts. Digitized materials, on the other hand, are materials that were originally analog and were turned into digital files, whether that was by scanning, photographing, typing up transcripts, anything like that. Because I know a lot of people are interested in digitization and because it's one of the major ways in which archives end up with digital files, I just wanted to start with a few tips about digitizing your um, paper and photographs. It's relatively simple to establish a basic scanning setup for personal use or for use at small institutions. I just have a few tips on this slide. You'll want to choose a scanner with the appropriate resolution. Um, 300 to 1500 dots per inch is the unit that scanners often use. Uh, many scanners will meet this threshold and there's tons of guides out there to help you choose one um, based on your budget or other purposes. When you scan, make sure there's no dust on your scanner or photographs. Um, you'll want to choose an uncompressed file format such as TIFF. And you'll also want to name your files in such a way that you can know what the files contain without having to open them. Um, I've added some links to the resources document that I think Josh probably shared with you all. Um, the links in that document that I've added will have more technical inf information and workflows that I would encourage you to reference if you're thinking about digitization. Um, I'm talking about digitization here because we're talking about digital formats, but I also want to point out it's not the same thing as digital preservation. Um, you'll need to care for your digitized files, just as you would care for the original paper and photograph materials. So the same general archival principles that we've been talking about also apply to uh, digital content just as they do to analog content. Digital content also needs to be described in context, collected ethically, follow the guidelines that are laid out in deeds of gift and copyright law, <clears throat> but digital content is different because it presents very specific technical challenges. The way digital content is stored and accessed presents a lot of complexities, um, it's difficult to actually access and preserve content on digital formats in a way that analog content is a little simpler. You can always look at a piece of paper, even if it's decayed, you can't necessarily open a file on a CD if you don't have a whole host of um, hardware and software that the file depends upon to be rendered properly. So I'm going to use my presentation time today to raise some of the issues that you might wanna consider. <laughs> Uh, digital content is not stable or static. Um, like paper and photographs, digital materials can degrade if they're left alone. Like I said, they can also become inaccessible because their ecosystem becomes inaccessible. Um, digital materials are vulnerable to hardware and software obsolescence. Maybe the piece of software you need to load a file isn't supported on a modern computer. Um, old computer media can suffer from bit rot where the data on the media actually decays. And human error and intentional harm are both also risks. It's not hard to delete, remove, or modify a file by accident or on purpose. So archivists work to ensure the fixity and authenticity of born digital content, which means that we want to ensure that the content that we have stays the same as it was when it was received. This is really important to us because it lets us be sure that the materials we're looking at are exactly as they were when the donor gave them to us. It also lets us know that nothing has changed in either the transfer process initially when we've received the materials and in the intervening period where we're storing the materials and stewarding them. Some kinds of content can prevent, present <clears throat> particular preservation or access challenges, anything interactive or complex, anything that relies on a particular file and directory structure, it's looking for files in a specific place, um, anything that relies on a specific operating system, any websites or social media <clears throat> that are subject to individual companies' terms of use, 
And then I also want to make the point that digital preservation requires you be able to control the actual files that you are preserving. So this means that social media and cloud storage, um, where you depend on another company for access to your data, is not digital preservation in the way that I'm talking about it today. And digitization, as I mentioned before, digitization on its own is not digital preservation. You are making the, the physical materials more accessible by making them digital, and you're potentially preventing <clears throat> further wear and tear on the physical materials themselves, but you're also going to have to steward the digitized files over the long term. So if you're acquiring digital materials, the appraisal step, similar to with regular manuscripts materials, is a great place to get a handle on what you're preserving by sitting down and talking with the donor. And I'm referring to an archivist donor relationship here, but that's just a shorthanded example. This set of questions is you know, supposed to be inspiration for how to get a handle on a collection, whether it's your own materials, at a collection of a family member or friend, or a more formal relationship with a donor. Um, and all of the questions may not be applicable to your own situation, and that's okay. <clears throat> so the first set of questions here are logistical. Where are the donor's files stored is a good place to start. You'll want to know what kinds of physical formats you'll be working with. So are the files on their home computer? Are they on CDs and DVDs? Are they on floppy disks, jazz disks, computer tape, all the fun <laughs> life cycle of computer media? Um, you'll want to know what the condition of the collection is. <clears throat> Are the disks scratched? Are the hard drives a little beat up? Um, if the collection is more than 10 or 20 years old, do you have a computer that can connect to this format or read this format? If you don't have something on hand, you'll want to either find a vendor who can reformat the specific format you're working with or source some hardware to reformat it yourself, which is the route that we usually take. You might be able to ask the donor for this hardware as they may still have the drives that they worked with, um, and that has helped us in a number of cases. It's also possible that you're collecting materials that aren't on physical storage, so maybe um, the person you're working with has a cloud storage account or wants to give you their email through a browser client or social media accounts or websites. We'll talk about some strategies for these kinds of materials later in the presentation, but you'll want to know that they exist. You'll also want passwords to everything you need to access, um, whether it's someone's accounts or their files. Sometimes people password protect their files or encrypt their um, storage. And then how much digital storage are you going to need to hold all of the materials that you're acquiring. If you're working with files that you can access on a modern computer, you can see this by getting information about the file or folder um, in your file explorer. If you have computer media um, that's older, you can try to estimate the amount of storage space you'll, you'll need by counting the number of each type of media and multiplying that by a standard storage size. And I provided a table in the resources document in case that's your um, particular use case, say you have like 100 floppy disks, you can estimate a rough storage amount that you're going to need to store all of those files, even without being able to access them in a modern computer just yet. Um, the second set of questions here are content based. So this helps us get an overview of the types of content we'll be acquiring. You're going to want to ask how the donor organizes their files. Um, this is both good so that you know what you're collecting, and it also helps you really narrow down the files that you actually want um, to what's in scope. It's ideal to use the appraisal step to avoid acquiring files that you actually don't want to preserve. Um, in some cases, that's just duplicate files. Um, in other cases, that's um, if there's any sort of personal or sensitive data mixed in with the collection that you don't want or need. Um, for example, someone may, you know, and this is true of my own personal file organization occasionally too, if someone has, you know, a passport scan mixed in with their working files, you would love to identify that before making the transfer. Um, I'd also ask whether anything in the collection is interactive or dependent on specific, especially older software, because this is a great chance to get a copy of the software that um, it's dependent on if the donor has it. Um, and in some cases, people can't access their own digital files and they're not going to know what's on any given piece of computer media and they're not going to be able to answer these questions and that's also okay. It's totally fine. But if you have the chance, now is the time to 
get an overview of what's actually on any given hard drive that you'll be acquiring. On this slide, I'm going to go over some strategies for doing the actual file transfer. Um, there are over two slides, the first slide here being the basics for people who are beginning to work with digital materials, and then the next slide will be an overview of more advanced techniques. Um, limited resources don't have to stop you from adopting good digital preservation practices. Any steps you're able to take are better than no steps. It can be an iterative process where you're adding on more complex concepts as you become comfortable with the basics. So the first thing I'd say would be to, when you're moving files around, use a transfer tool with transfer management. And by this, I mean something that can be restarted easily if it fails, something that reports errors to you when it encounters them, and something that verifies that the files have transferred properly. When you move files by dragging and dropping from one window to another, the built-in utility that you're using there can fail easily and it doesn't do any of that. It just, it can often fail silently. Um, you can't be sure that all of the files are the same on both ends. So, and sometimes these errors actually change the files you've been given. Um, they can leave actual data out of the file or change information like the modification date. So I've put some example tools on this slide that will manage your transfers better that you may want to consider using instead of drag and drop. Another thing you'll want to do is to create an inventory of your files. This is one way to tell that you have everything, just like you would if you were working with paper materials. You, this is both useful for the initial transfer where you're verifying that you have everything the donor thinks they're giving you, and it's also useful for long-term preservation. So a few things to note here would be a list of file names, um, total number of files, and a total size of the collection. You um, may also want to jot down notes about the file contents here. If you have the technical bandwidth and monetary resources, um, a couple other things to think about would be using a write blocker to transfer files. This is a piece of hardware that lets you copy from a piece of media, but it prevents you from writing to that media. So it keeps you from inadvertently changing whatever's on the hard drive, et cetera, that you've been given. You might also want to consider, instead of transferring files, creating a disk image. Um, very briefly, a disk image is a bit-for-bit -bit copy of all the data on a piece of storage media. So you're transferring the entire contents of the drive, including system files, hidden files, deleted files, everything that is sort of forensically present on the drive, not just the individual files that you're trying to acquire. This is a strategy we use when we have particularly old media that might be failing. Um, so you maybe only have one more read on it. Or if you have older complex or interactive file types or file systems that depend on having sort of a full structure of the disk present. Um, you could also think about creating checksums, which are sequences of numbers and letters that uniquely identify a file. And you can use those to check data for errors. Our time today is too brief to get into any of these topics in too much detail, but I've added a number of links to our resources document for anyone who wants to learn more. Long-term digital preservation basics. Um, the most important thing you can do for the long-term survival of your materials is to make copies of them. The uh, three to one strategy is one that I'm telling you about here. Um, I think it's a good rule of thumb. It's basically have three up-to-date copies of your data on two different types of carriers. So this means don't just have all your copies on three identical hard drives, just in case, for example, that brand turns out to be defective. Um, and you'll want to store one of your copies of your data in a different geographic location. And that point is in case of natural disaster, which is particularly important for us in earthquake prone California. So um, cloud storage here is actually a helpful tool to diversify your backup strategy. It's a different type of carrier than say a hard drive or your local computer. And it's often in a different geographic location because when you store files in the cloud, you're storing them on the company's servers and they're usually in a different location than we are in. But since we also are in Silicon Valley, it's something that you might wanna think about. Um, cloud storage, shouldn't be the only copy of your data is the other thing. Um, you'll want to have a local copy that you control. So you can use your original inventories to account for all your files. Um, in order not to change those files, it's best to make copies of any files you want to open before opening them. 
Um, this is so that you don't accidentally modify the contents in any way. And then um, don't discard your original media if you're working with um, physical media that you've been given, just like you wouldn't throw away a photograph you've digitized. Um, you've gotten the data off it and that's great, but you may find yourself wanting to go back to it just in case anything happens to your, to your data that you're preserving. Next steps would be um, instead of using your inventory to um, compare your files, you can make a much more rigorous and automated comparison by generating checksums for the same files over time and comparing them to make sure they're the same. A collections management system might do this for you as well. Um, it might also monitor other important digital preservation points. This can make them work worth the overhead for a large collection or an institution. So I've included a resource in the resources guide about how to pick a collections management system. Uh, and finally, the digital storage and file formats we're preserving will themselves become outdated. Um, so to keep digital materials preserved into the future, you're going to need to make more copies and migrate them off of today's hard drives and cloud storage. So unlike analog materials, you can't just open a box and physically sift through photos or skim through papers. Um, we, we need <laughs> to get digital materials off of their aging carriers, but we also need to be able to access that content continuously through the future. And access is what I'll close out my slides with. Um, a phrase I hear a lot in preservation work is preservation without access is pointless. Um, this was coined by a Library of Congress film preservation task force, and it rings true to me. Um, if we can't ever access the materials, it's tough to justify preserving them. Um, but digital materials are particularly complex, and so that makes it a tough issue. We have a lot of different ways to render content on different carriers and in different formats. So each of the following case studies highlights some of the barriers to access that we've tried to work around. So first is emulation. I've talked a lot about obsolete software and hardware, but how do we actually provide access to materials that rely on these older ecosystems? Um, one way is through emulation, which essentially asks modern hardware and software to act like older hardware and software. So emulation allows us to mount and run um, old computer media on our modern computers because it's faking sort of a modern or an older operating system that can understand what's on the media. So on the screen is a screenshot of the emulation as a service infrastructure, which is a project we participate in through a consortium of libraries. In this screenshot, I'm booting up Windows 95 on my current MacBook so that I can show a researcher the content on a CD-ROM from the late 90s, which is very cool. Um, other digital materials rely on contemporary software, but software that's not designed for great archival access. Email is a good example. If you've ever used the search function in Outlook, um, you'll understand why modern email clients don't make for a great user experience. In addition, email, because it's correspondence, is full of confidential, restricted, or legally protected information. So this slide is a screenshot of EPAD, the email processing software we use to screen and redact email. EPAD also uses machine learning to extract subjects and group emails by keyword, mood, correspondent, etc. One of the big goals of digital preservation is keeping files static and unchanging, but the nature of some digital materials is that they themselves change rapidly over time. So with websites, we want to capture snapshots of the user experience as it evolves. But there's so much content online and it changes so often that we really need to automate this work. We use tools called web crawlers <clears throat> to monitor and capture Stanford related websites on a regular automated basis. The nature of web archiving is a great reminder that digital materials are both ephemeral, they change rapidly, and physical. They're stored on physical web servers that can fail or be destroyed, and with them, all their digital content goes away. Sucho, or Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, is a volunteer initiative partially organized by one of our Stanford Library's coworkers, Quinn, to crawl and preserve web pages representing Ukrainian cultural heritage sites that are currently at risk of being destroyed by the Russian invasion. And if you're interested in learning more about web archiving, this is actually a great volunteer opportunity. Um, you, it's got a lot of great how-to guides about how to archive websites, and um, you'd be doing some good also while you learn how to crawl a website. So if you're interested, um, give it a Google.
Um, social media such as Flickr, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you name it, is maybe one of the toughest digital preservation challenges because you don't have control over your own data in these cases. If you're looking for a way to extract an account's data, you almost always need access to the account itself. There's often an option to download all your data somewhere in the user settings. I would recommend Googling instructions on how to download a user archive for the site you're thinking about, but you're typically gonna get whatever file format, whatever data the website wants to give you, and you're gonna get nothing of what they don't want to give you. It's good practice, even despite the limitations, to download archives of your social media data regularly if it's something you're trying to archives, archive, <clears throat> because websites are usually under no obligation to retain your data. Um, for example, Flickr, which I have a screenshot of here, when it was bought by a company called SmugMug, the new owners decided to limit free accounts to a thousand images and videos when the number was previously unlimited. So they gave users a few months to download all their photos and then permanently deleted everything past the first thousand photos of the account. If you don't have access to the account you're trying to preserve, there are sometimes options for downloading content with only public access, but these usually require um, both a willingness to technically circumvent a website's terms of use and a lot of patience or the ability to automate on the command line. So for example, I've got a screenshot of YouTube up. There are many websites that will um, download YouTube videos. There are many command line tools, but if you're not comfortable using the command line, you're probably going to be limited to downloading the videos one at a time. And that gets time consuming, depending on how many videos you need. So. You can see that with digital materials, you're never going to be at a loss for interesting challenges, but I also want you to know that anything that you can do will be a benefit your, to your digital materials. It does not matter if you can't implement all of these suggestions. Um, you really can take it one step at a time. Um, it never gets, it's never simple. So if you find it challenging, you're not alone. Um, it just matters that you have a sense of what you need to anticipate and what the challenges and pitfalls might be, um, because that gets you further along than many people. So thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Again, I, I hope you enjoyed that. I know it's um, you know never fun just watching a, a video probably, but uh, I find Annie a fantastic colleague, and I, I found that really, really interesting. So I hope you did as well. And in fact, I think it, she got right at one of our previous questions um, about um, YouTube and YouTube recording. So uh, that was also Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about some contemporary approaches, um, but we are sort of on the trajectory of, of wrapping things up. Um, we, we do have some um, group exercises as well um, to look forward to. So uh, I hope you uh, can stick around. So uh, these are some contemporary approaches that I find across the archives field, uh, both physical analog materials and, and digital content like Annie was describing. Um, so certainly there's been a push towards uh, centering marginalized voices, right? I, I, I don't think um, it's a mystery maybe why, uh, why that's true, um, but uh, I, I've definitely seen um, that, um, that trajectory over, over the last few years. And it's certainly been true for us at Stanford. Um, I mentioned some of the ways in which um, institutions are um, you know, not the only players in town when it when it comes to um, supporting archiving of materials, and that um, there have always been community archives, but there's um, grant support and other kinds of support that's available for community archives, um, and these are typically fall under this concept of uh, post custodial collecting. The idea is that um, there are many ways in which, or non custodial collecting. Um, the idea is that there there's many ways in which institutions, um, you know, can potentially play a role in helping to preserve and, and ensure future access to materials without actually helping to store them in some ways or, or serve as a good partner and collaborator without physically taking the materials um, uh, away from the groups that, that they're um, purporting to help. Um, I would say it's also true that institutions and researchers are getting much more comfortable working with digital content and data. Um, so that impacts the types of materials that we're collecting, as well as how we provide access to it. And you heard Annie talk about some of the great um, collaborations, uh, as well as tools that are available to help with accessing content um, as uh, not just sort of accessing data as data, but accessing content that you might not firsthand think of as as data as something that a uh, 
could serve as a data set and that you could study uh, on a larger scale, um, our, all of our collections are, are currently you know, being reassessed and reanalyzed to consider them in this way for, uh, to answer new types of researcher questions and, and to support new types of work. Um, and uh, along those lines, institutions uh, are collaborating on standards and tools to make it easier for people to um, find archival collections, to access them, to use them in really in, in new and innovative ways. Um, and we're benefiting from all the general changes in technology that happen, right, in commercial sectors and, and other kinds of um, sectors. Um, speaking to that centering of marginalized voices, there's this uh, great quote that I love from Michelle Caswell um, reporting on uh, one of her studies. The experience of seeing oneself in history and the changed sense of being that results from such reflection was a recurring theme. The interviews confirm the importance of the ontological impact of community archives, the ways in which represents, representation changes how community members exist in, interact with, and move through the world. Um, so this has really been a guiding principle for a lot of the work uh, that, that we do, and I, I think that's true for, for many, um, that we see the power of archives, right? And I, I think, um, you know, simply by attending this workshop, I, th I think um, you, you probably have a sense that um, it's really important what, what we keep um, and, and whose stories are told, and, and that I think is reflected uh, in, in this quote. Um, there's some other approaches I, I just wanted to mention, um, especially um, because uh, I, I think when people hear of, of Stanford, maybe they have some expectations, but the, the, this is a little bit larger than Stanford. Um, one is that um, all the different work that's going on in machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, as, as Annie mentioned, um, the field of archives has, has not been sort of independent from that. Um, tools and solutions and questions that are asked and challenges and collaborations have sort of followed those larger societal questions. Um, so there's lots of new tools like EPAD um, and, and other types of tools like one or two that I'll show you um, that are, are being used to help um, ask new questions and, and provide new types of, of answers. Um, I always find this sort of uh, mind blowing. This is a tool um, from Yale called PixPlot. Um, which was taking a lot of unidentified, uh, there's a repeating video, but the, the software takes a lot of photographs which might not be identified in any way and tries to um, categorize them and aggregate them um, in different ways. So here it might be um, based off of what the people are wearing or the type of photo um, that it was taken, whether it's a studio photograph or something. It's just some ways in which we can begin to um, hopefully use um, computers and, and artificial intelligence machines in, in ways um, that could could help get at really the, the millions and millions of digital files that people are sharing that we'll, we'll probably want to preserve a, a good chunk of. Um, and that was sort of towards images. This is a really cool project that came out of MIT um, that, that I uh, that I've seen that uh, was, I think, created by Andromeda Yelton there. And the idea was that they, they're sitting on these great collections of dissertations and theses and other kinds of literature or even gray literature, governmental publications. Um, and they really want to unlock those and make those much more discoverable. Um, so they were using um, machine learning to create a recommendation engine, right? So if you found a thesis you're interested in, um, you could use this tool to, to find some other writing that, that was sort of similar. So, you know, it's the sorts of thing you're probably used to seeing through, um, you know, YouTube or Amazon, um, but libraries and archives are also using to help provide um, access to their materials. So um, we're now coming across an exercise. Um, these are a couple of exercises that um, Annie and I are hoping, um, you know, bring to tie together some of the things that we've all been talking about. Um, and I'm going to see if I can monitor the chat and uh, the attendees. And maybe you could, hopefully everyone has the opportunity to, to raise their hand if they like to talk. Um, but I was hoping to just hear from folks sort of what goes through their head based on the conversations we've been having with these exercises, either um, what stands out for them as a particular challenge that they read, that they read on this slide, uh, or else um, you know, a take on maybe a potential step towards a solution. So um, exercise one, you've been collecting old paperwork and saving digital files for several years now at your nonprofit. 
including meeting minutes, uh, sorry, small nonprofit, including meeting minutes, internal reports and photographs and video from events your group sponsored that were created by your volunteer photographer or shared by community members. Um, you have no dedicated budget for this initiative, but you wanna try your best to preserve the materials and ensure future access to them. So what steps can you take to get support internally for this work? And what are your biggest priorities in the short and long term? So I hope that people can raise their hands. If not, um, please chat with me and I can start adding people and, and uh, letting, letting you uh, be able to, to talk as part of the webinar. Lori. Hi, I don't know if this is accurate, but I guess my first thoughts from what I've heard would be to sort of, um, one thought is to save and preserve what exists even without being able to transfer things. So paying attention to storage issues, et cetera. And then some kind of cataloging and capturing what's there, um, given that there's no dedicated budget for moving things along, I, I would think that preserving what exists um, and securing it and finding out what's there could be a first step. I think that's exactly right. I, I, that's a great answer, right? So um, it might help to think about the, the paper stuff and the, the digital stuff um, a, a little bit differently, but I think exactly what you said, you wanna take stock of what you have, um, right? And make sure that it's, it's not actively, um, you know, there, there isn't a water leak right above it. It's, it's not stored in a place where it, it's, um, where it's getting worse, where, where it's continuing um, to experience harm. Um, and then you wanna um, get some description, right? Uh, try to be able to identify what that stuff is um, so that you know, if you were going to try to advocate and say, this is a good use of my time, right? It would probably be helpful if you could say what the stuff is and, and why maybe it um, you know, uh, relates in some way to the mission of the organization or, or meets some larger um, organizational function. Uh, anybody else? I can't, it looks like Pam Moreland. Let me allow you to talk, Pam. Hi, yeah. Um, I try to find a repository, um, some organization, a library, a historical society that would um, one, work with the group and two, give us guidance and maybe help us um, start, start the process. So ask an expert. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I think that also gets at some we were talking about earlier in terms of um, finding consultants, finding experts, right? And I, I think that's true both for the immediate concern of protecting the files um, that you already have, as well as generating a program so that you're hopefully will continue to generate files and collect files and, and you'd have some pieces in place to know uh, workflows, to know how to handle those things. So simply getting started and, and having champions and supporters, I, I think is a, is a great step. Okay, um, any, any other thoughts about this exercise? We've got one more exercise after this one. Oh, I think I see. Yeah, hi, it's uh, Pamela Beard. I'm the president of the Mountain View Historical Association and we're just starting to address this. So I don't have any words of wisdom, but you know, there's so many little organizations that have, we have a large inventory. We haven't been keeping track of our agendas, especially during uh, COVID. Uh, we didn't, we have a history room at the library, but we haven't been able to get into that, you know, for 2021. So we have a real backlog of just trying to figure out what we need to do and how we need to do it and how we're going to do it. And so anyway, I'm, I'm just saying it's, uh, it's really daunting trying to figure out how do you do this. Thank you so much for, for speaking. Yeah, I, I totally appreciate that, which is we, Annie and I tried to create um, exercises that we thought people, you know, would really feel. And we, we've run into sort of this situation pretty often, right? You have a lot of people, it, it's not a shortage of excited, you know, people who are generating stuff, but, you know, it's, it's helpful to sort of think out um, a plan, finding um, experts who can, can talk about different aspects of, of um, the problem and, um, 
you know, the different challenges and, and trying to, to take them one step at a time, right? So for the paper files, can you identify the different categories of stuff that might come in and, and where those currently are? are? Are those different categories all in a place that, that's kind of safe? Um, do we know what's there, right? What could we get? Um, are the boxes, are they in boxes or in a file cabinet, right? Uh, are, are the materials labeled in some way, right? So I think, um, you know, hopefully this exercise has you think of a whole bunch of different questions, right? And then for the digital files, same thing that Annie, you know, was, was asking, right? So this photographer has given us, a uh, volunteer photographer has given us some digital photos, um, you know, under what terms we assume we could use those however we want, but it would probably be good to just check with this photographer that that that, that is also, um, you know, their understanding. And when, when, you know, people from the community are sharing files with us, so do we want to try to organize that process? Maybe we want to create a campaign around collecting those materials, but maybe before we do that, we want a little bit more of a framework in place for knowing what we're going to do with that stuff, right? Um, so I, I think there's lots of different questions that um, that come up in this exercise, but I, I think those are all some really fantastic responses. So thank you so much for that. Um, the second question is going a little bit more towards the digital side. Um, so let me throw that one up. So exercise two, your family tells you they want to start a family archive. Specifically, they ask you to create a smug mug account to preserve their photographs. They encourage family members to mail their photographs to you so you can photograph them with your phone and add them to SmugMug. You ask where you should store the photos once they've been scanned, and they say, just throw them in the attic or throw them away, up to you. Do we have some uh, responses or thoughts or questions that come up from this one? Yes, Sue Ellen. Those photographs that they put up on Smug Mug are not secure. So they'd have to be put someplace where you you either have something that you put them on, it has to be put into a device, or you've got to find some secure storage up somewhere, but that's not secure. And by secure, do you mean um, like, there's no indication. Do you mean in terms of digital preservation? Right. right. Those yeah. photos might go away at any time. They can just... Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great example Annie gave. Right. So Smugbug bought Flickr, and and suddenly all the stuff loaded to Flickr. We had stuff on Flickr from the University Archives, but fortunately that wasn't for digital preservation. That was just for access. I was still annoyed when it when it went away though. Um, so yeah, I, I learned my lesson on that one, and I, I think that's a great point, right? So Smug Mug, as, as we've learned, is just a commercial service online that enables people to uh, share photos, right? But it, it's not in itself digital preservation. Other things that stood out? I'm seeing some notes in the chat as well. Um, from Natalie, I think this may have been about the last one. Um, I would want to make sure things are properly described, like who all those people are in the pictures, um, describing things and recording things in the pictures before we get who they are. File naming is also important. That's great. Um, oh, yeah. I wouldn't want to throw away the real photos either. Yeah, so this one, um, right, it, the, there's a place where you know, they say, well, what should we, you ask, what should you do once I've taken photographs of the photos, right? And they say, you know, I don't care at that point, you know, you've taken care of it, right? But we know that's not true, right? We know that if you take a photo of uh, another photo, um, there's going to be some degradation anyway, right? I, I don't know if you've ever uh, done the thing where you take photos of photos of photos, but um, trust me, when or, or photocopies, trust me when I say that they end up not looking very good, right? Um, but as, as Annie also mentioned, right, we don't want to throw away uh, the originals. Um, first off, because we don't know what's going to happen to Smug Mug. But second off, there might be some other reason why we decide maybe we have a better scanner in the future, right? Maybe we decide we weren't actually capturing all the information we thought we were capturing. So uh, I definitely would agree that we'd want to hold on to the original photos as well. Any other thoughts about this exercise? What about throwing them in the attic? Does that sound like a good solution? <laughs> 
well, no one's volunteering, but I think attic, basements, right? All of those are on the list where you're going to potentially get, uh, I see, please use a photo album for the very least. And someone wrote, depends on the attic. Okay, that's true. Some people have remodeled their attics and maybe they're, they're very nice. But typically when I think about basements or attics, um, you know, and someone says that's, that's where the materials are going to be shared um, or, or stored, it makes, it makes me nervous as an archivist just because I've, I've rescued materials from flooding or from broken pipes um, or insulation problems or, or other kinds of damage. Um, you know, especially spaces that people don't go into as often or that experience temperature fluctuations. Um, we really want to be careful around those. Um, how would you keep track? Let's, let's, you know, they asked you to preserve the photos. Let's say where you're doing, you were doing your best and you wanted to sort of um, track what you could about the photos, right? What kinds of information would, would you try to keep track of and how do you think you might do that? Yes, Sue Ellen? Well, you, you want to get as much metadata about that photo as you possibly can at that moment in time. So wherever you got them from, go, go back to the source as far as you can go, whether it's uh, the person that gave them or somebody told you something about the photo. But um, yeah, working in a volunteering in historical society, oh, it's so important. You get that data information there now. Then we can create beautiful metadata. I, I think that's great, right? So maybe if you, if you are going to digitize them or track them in some way, maybe you want to uh, name the files after the family member who sent them, right? That sounds like important information because maybe if they sent you one, you know, that was the one they thought the most, but maybe they've got 50 more. They just didn't know you were interested, right? So just, just knowing where something came from is often very helpful, or they might be a good person to ask um, you know, where was this taken or who's in this photograph, right? Um, but all the, all the um, sort of de description fields we had talked about earlier, right? Who's in the photo? When's the photo from? Where was the photo taken? You know, wh what is depicted, right? Trying to capture that information as soon as possible, I think, is, is just as critical as, as um, you know, digitizing it and, and, and putting it elsewhere. I, I think all of those are, are really helpful to ensure people understand what that photo is, is meant to be. Oh, I, I think I see some other Q&As. Um, let me check that. Recommendations for moving old VHS tapes to, to digitization. Um, oh, thank you, Pam. I, I see you answered. Data image was taken. People in the photo who took the photo. Um, that's wonderful. That's great. Um, so for the old VHS tapes, um, there are some solutions that are available online. I think you're asking the right question, right? Obviously, it's hard to get a VCR at this point. Um, and every time you play a tape on a VCR, I don't know if you had an old tape that you would play over and over or someone in the family would play over and over and you'd see how it degrades, right? So we really want to try to digitize uh, that content as soon as possible. Um, there are, depending on where you are, there are some uh, fairly low cost or at least reasonable vendors in the area. Um, who, who can provide that service. Um, and occasionally historical societies or archives, um, you know, also have tools or an in-house lab that, that can help with that. Um, so that's a, it's, it's a really great that you're asking that question. I, I think when we think about material, it's one of the questions we ask um, when we're meeting with a donor, right? Do you have digital files? Uh, do you have media in, in obsolete formats? Which formats, right? And that way we could try to plan ahead um, to, to think about how we're going to manage those materials so that they don't just uh, melt on the shelf um, when we bring them in, right? We, we want to um, get the, in that case, with that kind of content, we want to um, digitize it really well professionally um, as best we can. Um, so thank you for that question. Do you have any recommendations for cataloging software or systems? Um, sorry, I, I see a question from Sarah Panzer. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I think if you're talking about um, for personal materials um, or, um, you know, materials kept in your family or a small organization, um, there are some document management systems that are pretty good at tracking that kind of stuff. And then, of course, just your operating system um, often has, um, you know, different fields that I, I don't 
use all of them, but even using Mac OS, um, there, there are different ways. And of course you could search across all the content on Mac OS. Um, ah, for community archiving. So uh, I'm glad Sarah to, to, to chat with you um, afterwards about this as well. Um, there, there are some open source, I, I believe cataloging solutions, but a, a lot of those are sort of you pay for the ongoing service. Um, there, there, I would look for a cataloging system that's, that's broadly used by sort of other peer groups. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to chat with you. I think most of the ones that, that I'm familiar with um, are ones that are used by large academic organizations, but I know that there are um, some cataloging solutions and often they might be tied into um, tracking other kinds of material, um, circulation, um, cataloging, maybe even creation of finding aids. So I'm really glad to chat with you about that um, offline, Sarah. Thank you. Yes, Sue Ellen? Okay. Here's my question. So a volunteer at Sunnyvale Historical Society, we receive what the, 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 the people who are in charge say is an important archive because it's from the a direct descendant of the founding family. So everybody's all excited about it. Okay, now you, the archivist, you've got to take care of this and make it all work because everybody's excited to see this stuff. So a big part of the excitement was around this big, huge, I mean, giant box of letters folded from the um, last half of the 19th or, and the, you know early 20th century, they were folded, so it was hard to tell what was going on exactly. You know, didn't want anybody to touch them or even breathe on them until we found out. So um, we started to work on them and found out that they were actually outside of the family tree from the, the, what we want the provenance. It was the father of somebody who married into the family. So now I go back to the director and say, these are not what you thought they were. These are not directly related to the family. She agrees and says, okay, but we still need to keep them. And so they, they have nothing to do with what we keep or what we want to say. They aren't the Murphy family archive. So um, my only thought was, I just, we just, you know, organize them. We didn't take them all apart or anything. Organize them by day two from, came up with four flat boxes, have stored them, have brief records, but my, my next step is I want to find out who wants these because the, the letters are actually um, to and from somebody else who is important in another part of Santa Clara. He was in the in the Santa Cruz Mountains and part of the railroad community, and there's still a winery named after him. And so he's important. And I am happy to just say, we're not gonna do any more with them, but I feel like it's my responsibility to, to go outside of the organization. Do you think I should be thinking that or I just leave it up to the director? <laughs> well. That's um, a political question as much as it is um, a collection sure. of sort of archival best practices. Sure. I, I would say, I, I think, you know, something that we didn't touch on as much, we talked about prioritization and how each institution has sort of a scope or, you know, for each project, mm -hmm. there's lots of things yeah. to consider. Um, so we often um, come across materials that there's not a high um, access need for them right away, right? There isn't a faculty member who wants to work with them that we know of. There isn't a graduate student that would want to work with them that we know of, that no one in the community has asked us, um, you know, for, for readier access to these materials. Um, but for whatever reason, either they, they had been collected in the past or a decision was made to collect them, right? So we would do, I think, in that case, what you have done, which is what we consider efficient processing or minimal processing, let people know we have them, see if there actually is a need for them, you know, provide enough information for sort of someone to discover them online, right? So in, in terms of the archival processing, um, you know, that, that's great that we've done some work on them. On the other hand, um, I, I think I agree with you a bit in as much as, you know, if if, if they don't really belong with your um, 
association or your institution, then people aren't going to, you know, you're not serving really the needs of, of your clientele and, and your community um, by um, holding on to these materials, right? And in fact, it could be that some other organization would be really excited to have access to these materials and for, to provide access to them and would be thrilled, right, to know that they're available and that you've already done some work to describe them. So um, I do think that it's always touchy um, and, and can be a, a very difficult sort of conversation to have uh, and, and to explore. And, and it's not always, you know, very clear cut, but I think you're asking exactly the right questions around um, whether, um, you know, it's worth um, investing additional resourcing into this particular collection one and two, whether you should in fact also be considering, um, you know, potentially exploring another home for the collection if, if it's in fact not, um, you know, you're not the appropriate home for it. I hope that was helpful. Um, are there any other questions from the crowd of attendees? Um, so I got a question um, from Natalie. What about stuff like staples and paper clips? Um, so I, I mentioned that um, you know we we um, we don't always deal with every collection the same way. Um, and, you know, so on one level, I would say, for the most part, we ignore things like staples and paper clips when we're working through the collection, unless we think they would really limit access to uh, the materials. So a very um, old school way of working with archival collections would be right to remove every um, paper clip, replace it maybe with a plastic clip so it does, the metal doesn't degrade and rust get on the papers and discolor them right, and to remove every staple. Um, we really don't do that anymore. And even in the most extreme cases um, where we're really processing something heavily because we know how often it's going to be used and we want to protect the materials, um, it's really case by case. And only we would only engage in that level of conservation work if it was something that we were planning to digitize because we really wanted to provide online access or we knew it was going to be accessed so often that by not removing, by not spending the time up front, um, to deal with a physical concern like that, we were subjecting the materials to, you know, a, a undue risk, basically, and weren't being good stewards of the material. But I would say in general, we're, uh, except for practical reasons, sometimes when you put a lot of folders in a box and everything has paper clips on it, right, you, the folders bend in such a way that they don't support the materials. So there are sort of things you don't think about, right? For any one paper, it's fine, but you put all those papers, you know, vertically in a box in folders, and they tend to, to gum up the, the box a little bit. So there are some other considerations, but in general, we shy away from removing staples and, and paper clips. Um, again, unless it's going to be very high use or, or there's some other pressing concern. Thank you for that question. How about storing old clothing? This is a great question. Um, at the Stanford Archives, we have in fact, the, the um, Stanford tree mascot uniforms. Um, we, we have quite a, a large collection of mascot uniforms. Um, and this has been very difficult for us um, in some ways, right? It sounds very exciting, um, but I, I would do, let me just start by saying that not every archive needs to collect everything. And clothing and those sorts of objects present special considerations and concerns um, that can be really difficult. So a lot of times clothing is stored um, by institutions that manage those on dress forms, right? To make sure that the clothing doesn't degrade and it maintains its form. Um, we do have some clothing in the archives, but it's not something we, we typically seek out now just for that reason that for us, it's a fairly low research value, very high exhibit value, but we're unlikely to exhibit it. Um, that doesn't really answer your question. That, that starts your question. Um, there are um, specialty housing and boxes. Basically, you just want to support the materials and stop it from degrading, just like any other physical materials. Um, but again, it, it does sort of enter into a specialty space um, where often for the Stanford mas tree mascots, we have those hung on a frame in bags that protect them from you know, anything that might be crawling around, right? It's, you, you need to be especially careful um, with clothing that, that can be eaten and, and um, you know, um, at risk 
by different types of critters. It has different temperature and humidity considerations. Um, so all I can say is that um, I would, if it's something that you think is core to what, what you're trying to preserve or to your own materials and you just want to follow best practices for preserving those, um, I'm happy to follow up with you um, and put you in touch with somebody um, who, who works, I, I think, um, you know, at, at the uh, Fashion Institute and other historical museums, especially deal with clothing very often. Um, fortunately, in archives, we, we deal with clothing a little bit less often, but I'm, I'm happy to, to put you in touch with somebody who can answer um, that with more specificity. Um, FileMaker Pro, I, I see a question in the Q&A. FileMaker Pro is a searchable database. I fear it's going out of fashion. Am I wrong? Are there other more searchable, more uh, contemporary databases that we should move to? Um, that is also my sense of a FileMaker uh, Pro, um, that, that it is going a little bit out of fashion. It is, as far as I know, still supported. Um, it is not, we've sort of moved away from more general databases like FileMaker Pro uh, to databases that are aligned. Fortunately, um, like our um, circulation of archival materials, we, we've um, adopted a system called Aon that helps us manage those um, for our other kinds of uh, description. We manage those in, um, for archival materials, we use a database called Archive Space, um, which also helps us generate finding aids. So fortunately, we've been able to move away um, with uh, from some FileMaker Pro more generally. Uh, we mostly deal with legacy FileMaker Pro databases. And some of those we just export to Excel um, because you know we weren't using all the old FileMaker Pro you know, uh, functionality anyway, and Excel is just easier to work with. Um, but in general, uh, I, I don't know that there's been a great replacement um, for FileMaker Pro. So I'm sorry, I, I can't answer uh, better than that, Pam, but thank you so much for your question. Um, I see that there was a, a question. We have a Civil War diary and letters from the mother who lost her son in the war. How do we find a home for these items? Thank you so much uh, for, for that question, Carol. And I see Natalie um, also wrote to you. Um, yeah, this, this, is, um, this is a really, really uh, important uh, artifact and, and series of documents, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I found that there's a, you know, many historical societies um, in states uh, that were very heavily impacted um, by the war. Um, I, I would say most, most of the states that were uh, around at the time uh, do collect um, materials like this uh, in, in historical societies. And that's maybe most, li most likely if somebody's doing research on that particular state and the experiences of people during the Civil War. On the other hand, Civil War diaries are, are so sought after um, that you know it could be that much larger institutions at a federal level might be interested, the Smithsonian might be interested, um, and even Stanford could potentially be interested if, if there's, especially if there's some additional association um, to the area, right? Um, so if you're from the Bay Area, you might have, um, the good thing I, I would mention is, you know, if you, there's pluses and minuses for, for who you might approach about those materials. So if you approach a historical society in another state, it could be that's where people would look for those materials if, if on that family lived out of state. Um, on the other hand, it, it may be that they have many of these sorts of materials and maybe not a lot of resourcing to work with them. Um, it could be if you approached a, a local uh, historical association from the city or town um, where the family was from, um, this would be you know, an incredible find for them and they'd be able to uh, devote more resourcing towards putting it online. So there's a lot of questions to ask, but it, it sounds really fantastic and amazing. And I, I'd be delighted to talk with you online uh, uh, offline, sorry, Carol, to, to um, talk about some of the possibilities and, and maybe put you in touch with someone. Well, we're coming just up uh, about on time. Uh, we probably have, have time for another um, question with everyone here. Otherwise, I'm glad to stick around if there are any other questions. Um, I would just like to thank so much um, uh, Natalie for, for joining me on this call and, and also all the work she's done on this larger conference and then all of you for attending. I, I hope some of you were able to make it to some of the other events as part of this history and community conference. Uh, if you weren't, a lot of great other workshops on oral histories and digital archiving took place as well as a lot of great uh, panels and presentations on sort of the whole 
um, rigmarole of, of local and community archiving. It was really fantastic. And those recordings should also be available soon. Um, but I will share uh, the slides and access to that resource guide that Natalie shared uh, with you earlier to all attendees today. And I just want to thank you all so much um, for attending and I hope you enjoyed the workshop.